purely. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to our Sabbath school uh, se- season this morning. My name is uh, uh, Pastor D- Dr. Conrad Vine. It's a privilege to stand and share with you here this morning. Uh, for those of you watching online, we give you a warm welcome wherever you are watching this from, at home or on your tablet or device. And uh, during this Sabbath school um, session now for the next hour, uh, we will have a two parts. The first part will be myself. Um, I'll be, I've been asked to speak a, a brief history of the sexual revolution Uh, So I'll be speaking for half an hour on that, and then we'll be moving into a panel discussion uh, to discuss some of the topics that have been raised during this brief history. Um, So uh, I will try and keep this as as child-friendly as possible. Uh, We are discussing very sensitive topics. We're discussing topics that are very close to people's hearts and to their very identity. And so we approach this topic um, as Jesus did. He came full of grace and full of truth. And uh, truth without grace is a clashing symbol, and grace without truth is uh, really kind of pointless. So um, we speak today with grace and truth by the grace of God. I invite you to bow your heads with me, and we'll ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide our conversation. Our dear loving Father, I thank you that when you created our world, you saw that everything was very good. And Father, today we're living in the midst of an era of confusion and chaos an era where every man or woman does what is right in their own eyes. I pray, Father, that through this Sabbath school um, time now, that each one of us will grow in our understanding, not only of facts and figures and history, but we'll grow in our understanding of your love for lost humanity. I pray, Father, that your spirit will guide our conversation, that your angels will watch over this place of worship, and that your spirit will be the only spirit present within these four walls. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so I'm going to work my way from the 1940s onwards and uh, through to where we are today. Uh, this is really a, a hop, skip, and a jump through history. I'm going to touch on some of the highlights uh, of, of what's been happening in the last 70 years in the United States and in other parts of the world. I'm going to start out with the 1940s. Uh, there was a doctor called Dr. Miller. Um, he was a physician down in, in Nebraska. And uh, he argued that homosexuals were kind of normal moral people, but for about three or four days of the year, of the month, um, akin to a menstrual cycle, he argued that homosexuals lose their moral restraint and they act out on their sexual desires. He made it to Congress as a representative from Nebraska, and there he authored the uh, the sexual psychopath law. It was known colloquially as the Miller Act, and it made sodomy punishable by up to 20 years in prison, Uh, But anybody accused of sodomy had to be examined by a psychiatric team. And if you engage in repeated, uh, the repeated performance of homosexual acts will lead to a diagnosis as a sexual psychopath, and then you'll be committed to the psychiatric unit of St. Elizabeth's in Washington, D.C. And President Truman, he signed the Miller Act into law in June 1948. Uh, Throughout the 1940s, there was a lot of public uh, social hostility to homosexuality in particular, Um, Police departments nationwide, they hunted for homosexuals in in gay clubs and bars and other gay meeting places, Uh, for instance, uh, public restrooms. Uh, Sting operations were particularly common within gay bars. 
and there was significant public hostility to homosexuality in general. And during this time, we have to be honest about it, there was a lot of brutality when the police uh, did their raids on the gay bars. Um, there was a free use of the nightsticks and uh, roughing people up. Uh, this was a reality within across America in the 1940s. And when moving to the 1950s, we see that homosexuality um, is, is classified as, as a social taboo, and people viewed it as being the result of sexual maladjustment. There was some problem with your upbringing. It was viewed as a problem with your nurture rather than with your nature. You know, uh, by the time we get to the early 2000s, the idea is that you are, as Lady, Lady Gaga sing, you, sings, you are born that way, that it is part of who you are. It is your hardware rather than the software that is how you choose to live your life. But in the 1950s, the popular view was that homosexuality was a choice. It wasn't uh, inbuilt within you, that you chose the homosexual lifestyle. And uh, the uh, general idea in the American society was that you could cure someone of homosexuality through a wide range of therapeutic interventions, such as psychoanalysis, uh, residential group therapy, insulin shock, electroshock, um, or even frontal lobotomies. And wealthy parents across America would pay for their children to be admitted into institutions, and they went through a full range of treatment to cure them of their homosexuality. In the 1950s, President Eisenhower signed Executive Order 10450, uh, and he identified security risks. Um, this was the background. The background to this was the Cold War. There was the McCarthy um, push to root out you know, reds under the bed. Um, people were afraid of communism and the communists taking over the United States. And President Eisenhower needed to demonstrate his Cold War credentials. He was a true defender of the United States against the Soviet Union. And so in this executive order, he listed um, uh, communists um, as being a security risk to the federal government, but he also listed um, the sexual perverts, as he called it, by which he meant homosexuals. And so under Eisenhower's leadership, there was a push to remove um, all, all homosexuals from the federal employment due to the fact that they were perceived to be a security risk, that is, they could be blackmailed, and uh, the Soviets could blackmail a homosexual into passing them secrets because the homosexual didn't want it to be known that they were homosexual, or they were viewed as being morally corrosive upon their colleagues. And during the time of Eisenhower, tens of thousands of homosexuals were fired from federal employment across the United States. Very intrusive investigations were conducted. Uh, to anyone who was suspected of homosexuality. And parallel to that, um, in these days we have woke corporations, or well, back then you had woke corporations in the other way. Woke corporations across America were busy winnowing out anybody who they thought was a homosexual. Uh, just a very brief summary of what happened in the US military. Well, in the 1950s, um, American popular culture promoted motherhood, marriage, and apple pie for women. And for many lesbians, this was not what they wanted in life. And so many lesbians entered the United States um, Armed Forces, the Reserves, or the reg regular forces, because they could earn a regular salary and benefits without the need for a husband. They earned uh, regular pay, they gained excellent life skills, and they earned the GI Bill benefits. Uh, be neat and discreet was a common motto in the 50s and 60s in the lesbian community within the US military. When it came to homosexuals within the US military, and this is a, that sentence there is a very brief summary. You could write a book about this, but whenever we went to war, such as World War II or the Korean War or the Vietnam War, um, we started out with an attitude that we don't want homosexuals in the military, and as the needs for manpower grew, so as long as you were not an out-and-about homosexual and you were discreet about it, nobody would ask, and you could be let into the military. But when these conflicts finished, and the US military was downsized, such as after World War II, it downsized by almost 90%. Some of the first to be um, discharged were the, those who were known to be homosexuals. So the, rank, the homosexuals in the ranks rose and fell, depending on the manpower needs, and, um, but it was never publicly accepted within the military per se. And if you were overtly homosexual, then you were given a dishonorable discharge. And for those of you who served in the US military, you know that there are lifelong consequences for having a dishonorable discharge. We then come to the, I'm not sure, can we move on to the next slide? Uh, we then come to the, the um, early gay rights movement, the gay rights movement. A very famous gentleman was known as Harry Hay over in California. Um, he argued that homosexuals are an oppressed cultural minority within a Marxist and a communist worldview. He was coming at this issue from a Marxist perspective. 
Um, if you've heard my Wrong Think series, we talk about cultural Marxism. Well, he was arguing for this back in the 1950s, and he established a very famous organization known as Matashin. I think I pronounced that right. And Matashin, they, they started fighting for the rights of homosexuals to avoid entrapment by the police. And for the first time, we had the explicit linking of homosexuality with civil rights. And he argued that homosexuals needed to have their civil rights as US citizens honored by the state and federal authorities. In April 1953, there was the first convention of Matashin um, over there in the Bay Area. This was the first public meeting in US history of a group of, of, of open homosexuals. And they were discussing how they could lobby for their rights, how they could prevent police brutality and entrapment and sting operations. And during that event in 1953, speakers spoke of their pride in being homosexual. They anticipated walking down Hollywood Boulevard in a pride parade, arm in arm, proclaiming their pride and of the need to come out into the open. That was one of what the lesbians was challenging the group to do there. And the parallel to that in the 1950s in the lesbian world, the, the Daughters of Bilitis um, was a lesbian rights group formed in 1955 to help lesbians adjust to and prosper in a heterosexual dominated society. They published a, ma a, la a magazine called The Ladder. It sought to raise the political profile of lesbians and homosexuals as voters, that is, we are a voting bloc. Like, don't ignore us, we, we can vote at the polls. And they wanted to roll back the vag lewd and the other anti-homosexuality laws. Uh, vagrancy and public lewdness, uh, that involved, for instance, um, uh, doing sting operations with, with homosexuals in public restrooms and bars, and uh, the police setting people up and then arresting them under vag lewd laws. And so the ladder, that was their magazine in the 50s, uh, started to focus on the political rights of lesbians rather than on their social acceptance. And so the battle was fought, uh, starting to be fought along political lines. Um, when we come to uh, 1964, uh, there was a dialogue between homosexuals and uh, liberal pastors in the Bay Area near San Francisco. Now, out of that dialogue, um, the Council on Religion and the Homosexual was established as like a, a forum for liberal pastors and uh, homosexuals to meet and discuss their particular concerns and to promote an ongoing, ongoing dialogue between liberal churches and the homosexual community. Now, just as pastors in America in the 1960s were, um, stood by the African-American community in their struggle during the civil rights movement, so pastors were challenged to stand by homosexuals and their struggle for justice within American society. And out of that dialogue in 1964, uh, the, the first forum agreed that they said, love is the ultimate and the only norm of conduct. Um, love uh, means different things to different people. This was not agape love that they were talking about here. Uh, this was essentially um, you know, your, your sexual orientation, the ability to express uh, your sexual orientation. We carry on in the 1960s. Um, there were a lot of police raids on gay bars. And instead of being met with silence and fear, the homosexual community began to push back, quite literally. Uh, they would hurl their furniture, they would hurl food, there were angry confrontations with the police in the 1960s. In 1967, 1966, a young man called Steve Ginsburg started what became known as Pride, the personal rights in defense and education. We've heard of Pride parades, for instance. And uh, hundreds of Pride supporters began to demonstrate in front of police stations um, across the United States in response to what they uh, believed to be police brutality and sting operations uh, that had a profound impact on people's lives. Perhaps the leading figure in the gay rights movement in America in the last 60 years was a gentleman called Frank Kameny. I, uh, Kameny, I'm not sure how we pronounce I think it's Kameny. I tried looking like how do you pronounce this guy's name, but I never found it. He was uh, uh, thrown out of the US military. I think he was in the Navy when they discovered that he was homosexual. He was a brilliant astronomer, and he led a, a very active gay rights movement uh, political lobbying group in the in Washington, D.C. area from the 1960s onwards, all the way through to President Obama's era. He is perhaps the key single figure in the American gay rights movement. Now, he lobbied Congress. Rather than taking the, the, the battle to the streets, he recognized that you have to change the politics. And so he argued that homosexuals should have the full and equal civil rights and legal equality to heterosexuals within American society. He argued further that homosexuals should not wait for the heterosexual society to grant those rights to homosexuals, but that homosexuals should learn from the civil rights movement and they should be robust in their demands to achieve their own legal objectives in society. 
He litigated extensively. He, was a, uh, he, he fought many legal battles in the 60s, 70s, and 80s to help homosexuals who lost federal employment. He was extremely successful in this, taking up um, certain, certain individual cases. And after the Norton, Norton Macy and the Scott Macy decisions, the Civil Service Commission in 1969, I believe it was, issued an internal circular saying you cannot, you should not fire somebody for being a homosexual from the federal employment, and neither, and you cannot refuse to hire somebody because they are a homosexual. Uh, Kameny was a brilliant strategist. He was a keen thinker. Um, he held one press conference with a homosexual, and, and the homosexual said in front of the American media, I'm a homosexual. If everybody knows it, I can't be blackmailed, can I? So that's one of the arguments for not having homosexuals in public employment. You can be blackmailed by a foreign spy agency, but if you're out and about and proud about it, then you can no longer be uh, blackmailed. And so um, he was quite a brilliant campaigner. In 1969, you have the Stonewall riots, standing tall and pushing back, you might say. There was a police raid at the Stonewall Inn in, in New York, and the police attempted to arrest some of the customers. It led, firstly, to some peaceful protests, and then to what we may consider rioting, although rioting is a very fluid concept. And this came after this, this came as, after the context for this was the 1960s, America had a series of race riots, such as the Watts riot in 1965, the rioting in Cleveland in 66, Detroit riots in 67, and New York in 64. Those were mostly uh, on the fringes of the civil rights movement and the African American community lobbying for their rights and against brutality and uh, discrimination. And so um, in the context of America in the 60s where there was a lot of rioting, the Stonewall riots, uh, they're situated within that wider context that rioting um, was becoming uh, more, uh, more, not the norm, but it was happening more and more in America, particularly in the 60s. And some of the homosexual activists argued that they needed to model themselves after the militant wing, such as the Black Panthers of the civil rights movement, rather than the JFK wing of the civil rights movement. In the 1970s, uh, we have the, the lesbians, the kind of a parallel issue there. Um, heterosexu heterosexuality feeds male dominance according to the lesbian movements of the time. Lesbianism was a conscious choice. It was a decision to be a lesbian, to rid the world of patriarchy, sexism, racism, and imperialism to be replaced by socialism. And uh, so you have this kind of cultural Marxism feeding into the lesbian world. There was a group called the Furies who inspired a wide range of feminist collectives across the United States. And the, the, the lesbians, they saw homosexual men as just as much a problem as heterosexual men. And when there were sort of gay rights meetings, often it was the hetero homosexual men who were the dominant voice and the lesbians were kind of marginalized even within the gay rights movement. The solution for some of the le le lesbians was to be a feminist lesbian and to build an all women's world without men. So you might say back in the 70s that um, all lesbians are feminists, but not all feminists are lesbians. The first version of the Equality Act, which has now just been passed by the US House, came out in 1974. And they did not use the word sexual orientation or homosexuality. It used the word sexual or affectional preference. This was a very deliberate softening of the language in 1974 to try and get this thing through Congress. Um, but it never made its way out of committee. There was just too much political opposition to it. But activism in the 70s was transitioning from the streets um, through, to the, through to the political sphere where decisions were made. Parallel to this, there was the zapping of the psychiatrist. Zapping uh, was, was the idea that you go to a public meeting and you storm the platform and you kind of yell and shout and chant your slogans and you close everything down. And you get in people's faces and you kind of shout about it and so forth. Zapping was, was a tactic used in the gay rights movement to target individuals or people who were opposed to the gay rights movement. And uh, so in 19, where was it, 1971, the American Psychiatric Association was zapped by thousands of gay rights activists descending upon the, the hotel, I think it was in DC, and it descended into chaos. Now, out of that event in 1972, um, uh, Kameny and uh, Barbara Gittings, Barbara Gittings was a very famous gay rights movement leader. Uh, she was a lesbian. She worked very closely with Frank Kameny. Um, they agreed with the American Psychiatric Association that there would be a panel discussion, that there would be no more zapping, but there would be a panel discussion of the American Psychiatric Association. And they brought along um, a psychiatrist who put on one of those anonymous masks on his face, so nobody could tell who it was. 
and they were um, challenging the psychiatrists as to what is a mental disorder and what is a cultural bias. And uh, you know, every society has a range of normal behavior, and, and so when is something a norm within a society and when is something considered a psychiatric or a psychological disorder? We recognize that today. For instance, if you come from, um, say, Angola, it is not wise to have an American-trained psychologist working with you because the American-trained psychologist has a bell curve like this, and in Angola they may have a bell curve like that of what is considered normal. And so psychi psychiatry and psychology are very con um, socially and culturally conditioned as to what is considered normal. And so um, in the 1973 American Psych Psychiatric Association, they had a reference committee, and then their overall conference voted to replace the word homosexuality with the phrase sexual orientation disturbance within that version of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Dist uh, Statistical Manual. That's kind of the handbook of the Bible for the psychiatric profession. And psychiatrists were trying to keep in harmony with the changing cultural norms of what is a, of mental influence. And homosexuality, they declared, was not normal. It, it was not normal, it was just not abnormal, which is kind of like a, a fudge position, you might say. Um, debates raised in the psychiatric profession was whether homosexuality is a, is a dis disorder or not, and eventually psych um, homosexuality was dropped from the DSM. You then have the AIDS pandemic of the 1980s. Uh, it really began, we believe, in about June 81 with an article in the CDC's uh, weekly report on five young men who died. Well, they had a certain uh, disorder in the Bay Area. Uh, they, had a, they, uh, they all had severe immunodepression. And the AIDS pandemic swept America and around the world. Um, in 11th of October 1987, there was the second march on Washington. The first was the Civil Rights Movement march. By then, 40,000 AIDS victims had tragically passed away in the United States and countless numbers in else, elsewhere in the world. Uh, in this na nationwide culture of fear, there were nationwide attacks on homosexuals on the streets, and fear ruled the streets. Um, the, the gay rights movement pressured Big Pharma to do something about this. There were pop concerts and uh, very famous musical singers like um, um, the lead singer of Queen, what's his name, Freddie Mercury, who passed away with AIDS and so forth. And so there was a high profile campaign and by the mid 1990s, protease inhibitors were widely available and the death rate from AIDS dropped significantly across the United States. Modern day advances, uh, Bill Clinton came to office and he wanted to protect homosexuals within the military, even though there was significant pushback in the US military, there was a general consensus that we do not want active homosexuals in the military. And so uh, Bill Clinton and his counsel came up with a compromise called Don't Ask and Don't Tell. That is, if you are homosexual, lesbian, you may serve in the US military, you just don't be out and about about it, you might say. And, uh, but under that policy, over 14,000 American citizens were discharged from the US military. In 2009, President Obama, and President Obama is really the key president in all of this for the transformational changes. He signed the Matthew Shebert and James Byard Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. Uh, if you look into the stories of what happened to Matthew Shepard, it would make you shudder with horror. What those, what those people went through was absolutely savage and it should never have happened in any society. And so the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act was signed by President Obama. He then repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2010. He then amended Clinton's executive order 11478, prohibiting discrimination based on gender identity. And um, he also pre prevented discrimination on gender identity issues among federal contractors. In 2015, uh, we have the Obergfell versus Hughes case. That's where the US Supreme Court ruled five to four that the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution would require all states to perform and recognize same-sex marriages on the same terms and conditions as opposite-sex couples. And uh, right now, we have the Equality Act. The Equality Act was indeed passed by the House um, just a few weeks ago, it's now sitting before the Senate. Um, the only thing that's stopping it from being passed is the filibuster. If it gets passed, then President Biden will sign it into law. And if the Equality Act is passed, don't be fooled by the name. The Equality Act is not looking to respect the conscience of all American citizens. It is seeking to impose um, the LGBTQ ideology on everybody so that nobody can be discriminated against on the grounds of sexual orientation. And it is written in a very vague sense, because when it says sexual orientation, it literally means all sexual orientations. So theoretically, somebody who is self-confessedly attracted to minors, 
uh, could not be refused access to serve as a kindergarten teacher if the Equality Act gets passed, because that would be discrimination against their sexual orientation. So um, that's right now before the US Senate. And if you ever wondered about the filibuster being important, it is critically important for America right now uh, to ensure a balance of the rights of, of, the, of individual citizens. The state of Utah has actually passed an act that affirms the civil and legal and employment and housing rights of the LGBT community, whilst also affirming the right of faith-based organizations to live out their faith. And that's a compromise that they hammered out in Utah um, quite possibly because of the heavy influence of the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons across there in that state. But at the moment in America, there is no, air, there's no desire to compromise in that way. It's kind of winner takes all right now. And so the Utah compromise is not likely to happen at a national level. So um, among Adventists right now, uh, just a few weeks ago, um, this case here, Hunter versus U.S. Department of Education, it was filed. Um, it's uh, dozens and dozens of LGBTQ students are suing. Um, they've named a number of universities such as Baylor in Texas, um, Liberty in Virginia, La Sierra Adventists in California, Brigham Young in Utah. They're targeting every major denomination in this and they're essentially saying, they're asking the federal government to, to stop faith-based universities from upholding their faith-based principles um, and, or otherwise those universities will lose all access to federal funding. That's the bottom line here. Now, the U.S. Department of Education is not contesting this case, which means that this is probably going to win, which means that every university, including Adventist University, is going to have to decide if we accept, if we accept federal student funding for our students, we're going to have to buy into the whole LGBTQ agenda. That's where this is going with this. And there is no contestation on this case, so it's probably going to get be successful. And they're targeting... Um, key Christian colleges from all the major denominations to send a message that, that you have to do this or you lose your student funding eventually or any other federal funding. So, conclusions. And as you see in my sermons, I like to compare biblical worldview with that of, the, of other worldviews. I want to talk about the biblical worldview and sexual revolution here. When it comes to civil law, in the biblical worldview, civil statutes define crime and they deal with crime. They do not define sin or morality. And to break civil laws is an incivility. And that is the same with the sexual revolution. We share the same worldview when it comes to um, civil laws. When it comes to divine law, um, the biblical worldview is that divine statutes define and, and deal not with, civil, uh, with crime, but they deal with sin. On, that is um, harm, harming your, na your nature, but there's a moral component added to it. And to break moral rules is by definition immoral. In the sexual revolution, there is neither God nor revealed morality, nor divine law, nor a final judgment. It's very clear as you, as you look through the literature of the last 70 years, this is, uh, generally speaking, there are, there are Christians who are in that community, but by and large, you're looking at a much more atheist and Marxist outlook on the world. In terms of the separation of church and state, uh, from a Christian perspective, we assume the separation of church and state. Um, if you don't have a separation of church and state, then you end up with things like the Inquisition taking place. And so we recognize that we don't want to go down that path. It's better to have a separation of church and state. But in the sexual revolution, they have a different idea about this. It is that the state is supreme and the state is alone, and there is no assumption of the church within the secular worldview. The church could basically shrivel up and go away. And so when it comes to the role of the church in the biblical worldview, the church is entrusted by God with the gospel and God blesses us with the Holy Spirit to promote as the Apostle Paul calls it the obedience of faith among the Gentiles and to guide individuals to morality and to salvation. That is the purpose of the church. Uh, from the sexual revolution perspective, the church is merely a social actor, no different to the Daughters of the Revolution or um, the local chess club or whoever, whatever social, social association you have in your community. And uh, they should, their role is to be an ally of the LGBT community, but they are not to promote biblical or revealed morality because the sexual revolution by and large rejects the concept of revealed morality. And when it comes to moral framework within the biblical worldview, we live within, we are accountable to a revealed moral framework from God. Within the sexual revolution, and we find this particularly in what Kameny was arguing, he's perhaps the leading figure in the gay rights movement, there is no revealed moral framework and there is no moral accountability to God because God does not exist. Therefore, each individual is sovereign, we are autonomous, 
Auto means self, nomos means law in Greek. So autonomous means that you are a law unto yourself. That's what the word means. Each individual is autonomous and they seek happiness as he or she or they or whatever it may be chooses. When it comes to civil authorities and morality, as Christians we believe that civil authorities should not legislate for morality. The Inquisition or Sharia law is the logical conclusion of the state imposing their version of morality. Uh, but in the sexual revolution, they also argue that civil authorities should not legislate for morality. That was Kamini's argument in the 60s and 70s, that the federal government should not be de- uh, promoting a certain version of morality. But this is actually happening today via cancel culture. A new morality is being imposed on America, which is basically the absence of, of a m- revealed moral framework. So our time is almost up here, so I need to... I've got a couple of slides left, then we have our panel discussion. and Okay, there we are. So the, the arguments used by the gay rights advocates in the 60s and 70s and 80s, such as by Khamenei, who was a tireless campaigner in Washington, D.C., are ostensibly similar to those used by A.T. Jones in the 1880s when he was arguing against the Sunday laws. That is, Congress has no role in legislating morality upon the nation, but the role of Congress is to uphold the constitutional rights of all U.S. citizens, regardless of whether the majority rejects or accepts the practices of the minority. And so at at a surface level, there is a basic agreement. We would agree with the gay rights movement that Congress should not be legislating for morality, But of course, when we argued for that in the 1880s, there was the assumption that members of Congress had a Christian worldview. That was an implicit assumption behind that argument. But when members of Congress no longer have a biblical worldview, and they have, uh, say, an atheist worldview or a secularized worldview, then you might say all all bets are off, All, all, all options are on the table, all bets are off. So as the West has progressively abandoned scripture as the norm for, for society and has become more secular, so the inevitable consequence is the sexual revolution has advanced culturally on the streets, socially in popular media, politically in Congress, and legally with these various acts being passed by Congress. And in our brave new secular society, to be seen as a good person means being a vocal ally of the LGBTQ movement. So let's ask ourselves, it's a very, it's a, it comes to a point here that if sexual orientation under the Equality Act cannot be legally challenged or discriminated against, and the, Cong- the Equality Act does not define what they mean by sexual orientation per se, they don't exclude any sexual orientations, that's the key point in the Equality Act. And if the basic premise of the sexual revolution is that government cannot and should not legislate for any particular version of morality, then society will inevitably have to accept and normalize minor attracted persons, known as paedophiles, genetic sexual attraction, GSA, that is, as Pastor Kelly spoke about this morning, um, somebody's now suing New York, a parent, the right to marry a child, but they can't bear children. They're saying, why can't we marry? It's the logical conclusion of Obergefell versus Hughes, Obergefell and Hughes. Genetic sexual attraction, that's incest. Zoophilia, uh, that's the love of, of animals, otherwise known as bestiality. Necrophilia, which is predominantly a white middle-aged male phenomenon, um, that is breaking into a, a direct, uh, the funeral directors and making out with the dead bodies, multiple partner, same family marriage, etc. Uh, the Equality Act would essentially open all of this up to American society, and there is no moral framework left because you cannot discriminate against what people want to do. So without the biblical worldview, there is no longer sin per se in the United States, at least in the eyes of the sexual revolution, but the only sin remaining is for Christians to impose their bigoted biblical worldview and moral framework on others and to seek to live out their own faith. However, if you look through history, no society in human history has ever survived with a popular culture that refuses all moral constraint. No society has ever survived. If society says, do as you wish, period, and society cannot offer any moral judgment or framework for society, if you can literally follow the desires of your heart, then uh, no society in human history has ever survived for long with that kind of um, worldview. Without revealed morality, and this is what I would argue, that places protections of holiness on our behavior, on our attitudes and our social mores, society will inevitably degrade to the point of collapse at immense human cost. And even though this isn't directly related to the sexual revolution, I've been in parts of the world like Tajikistan and Afghanistan and other war zones, but when there is no accepted morality in society, then nothing is wrong. Everything is possible, and the human pain and suffering is absolutely immense.
the final screen here. Okay, Jeffrey Dahmer explained this thinking. Just before he died, he did a, a radio, a TV interview. And he was asked, why did you um, kill these other boys and why did you eat them? Why were you a, a homosexual who was cannibalizing the bodies of your victims? And he said, I always believe the lie that the theory of evolution is truth, that we all came from the slime and that when we die, that is it. If a person does not believe there is a God that we are accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? If there is no moral framework and no moral absolutes, then Jeffrey Dahmer, he lived that out. He says, I can take you back to my home as a rent boy. We can make love as homosexuals. I can then strangle you to death, dice you, dice you and slice you and put you in my deep freeze. And there's essentially nothing wrong with that. It's socially um, embarrassing. It's not comfortable for people to talk about. But if there are no moral absolutes, then why can't I do this? And Jeffrey Dahmer expressed very, in very articulate manner the logical consequences of what's happening in America today. So as Christians, as Jesus wept over Jerusalem, a city that was hurtling towards destruction, as some have said America is the new Jerusalem or whatever the case may be, we weep over our nation and over our communities and our society because our nation is likewise hurtling towards social destruction. And the, there'll be a huge consequence you know, for, for everybody, whether it's children, whether it's families, uh, whether it's people within the LGBT community. If there are no boundaries, then there are truly no boundaries, then the outcomes are going to be horrific for Western society. So that's kind of a brief history of the sexual revolution. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. This is just a hop, skip, and a jump through this topic. And I believe we now have a panel discussion, so I'd like to invite our panelists uh, to come up to the front here. Um, I believe we, we are ready to come up. And um, we're just going to be talking through some of these issues as uh, we come to the conclusion of our Sabbath school time together. So thank you very much. Well, good morning, church family. And uh, we are excited about this week and uh, what God has done leading up to this. I know it's going to be a blessing and a challenge. And I appreciate Dr. Vine's presentation. History is messy. It's difficult. And I appreciate you giving us an overview there. We're going to take some time and discuss some of the things and some of the issues that he brought up. And before we do that, let's bow our heads and we'll ask the Lord to be with us. Father in heaven, we recognize and realize our own limitations and our own feeble attempts to understand without the power of your spirit to guide us. And Lord, we ask that you would be with us now, that you would bless us. We pray for every presentation that will be made for all of us as we journey throughout this week, that you would challenge us, challenge us, that your spirit would guide us and lead us. We know that Jesus is coming soon, and I pray that you would help us to prepare for that day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin by thinking about one small thing. Someone once said a, a small error at the beginning of a journey 
is worse than a small error at the end of a journey. So I'd like to just for a moment discuss the importance of where we start. Where do we begin? We're addressing these kind of major issues that, you know, we don't live in a vacuum today. We're, we're in this flow of history and we're facing unprecedented challenges today. And so where do we begin? What is the significance of a starting point and a foundation? Yeah, let's introduce her. That's a good, that's a good thing. Let's start with Kizi over there. Kizi, would you just go ahead? Let's go around the... Yes, yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Kezia Chisholm and I'm an associate speaker with Coming Out Ministries. My name is Pastor Dennis Page. I'm an assistant pastor here at the Village Church. I'm Wayne Blakely, the director of Noah's Love Ministries. Uh, Conrad Vine, local church member here. And I'm Pastor Ron Woolsey, one of the co-founders of Coming Out Ministries. And I'm Bryce Bowman. I pastor at the Stevensville Church, not far from here. All right, thank you for pointing that out, Conrad. I appreciate that. Well, it was interesting that you said, uh, <clears throat> made the observation that a small error in the beginning is more consequential than a small error at the end. And uh, I just thought about my own experience when I was um, sexually molested at the age of four, and that one time event, and it totally derailed me. Uh, it had consequences that lasted through the rest of my life. Um, up to this point. It um, left me confused and frustrated and uh, feeling guilty and shame, and I internalized it, and without being able to process it at the age of four, who could, right? Um, it just really messed up my mind and prepared the way, being derailed. From then on, my life was off track. I would say that it is the impact of the stain of sin on the human body. Elaborate a little more what you mean. I'd be taken away from my presentation this evening. Okay, okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, you know, essentially, we have to go back to the beginning, uh, as, as you pointed out, uh, about how we got into this mess. So, yes, yeah, stealing from my presentation. Uh, it has to do with what started uh, the war in heaven um, and the, uh, the message of Lucifer to follow the dictates of our, only, of, our, of our will, of our Christ's will for us. And I would echo that, that uh, we are creating the image of God, all of us. And part of being created in the image of God is the capacity to love. And it's the yearning to experience intimacy and love and communion and to have that reciprocated. And for that to be in a meaningful and a safe space for each one of us. And so I think that as the concept of, as, as sin has progressed over the millennia, so our understanding of what love is has also changed. And we've, we've, we've often um, veered away from love to exploiting of others and gratification and to almost a perversion of what is love today. And one of the things that you mentioned, Wayne, is this great controversy idea, and this is one of the challenges of our day and age, is that this rejection of a unifying story that explains the universe. And so within that context, sin, evil, all these kind of things make sense, but how do we address these things in a very relativistic society that no longer has a context for understanding what sin is, or what evil is, or has a way to define these outside of, you know, the context of a culture. You know, I like to keep it simple. And uh, I'll ask parents, how many of them allow their children to dictate to you what's right or wrong? And the parents always tell me, no, that's not going to happen in my home. And I think about when God created humanity, he's God. What makes him God is because he gets to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And when we decide for ourselves and we take that role, then we make ourselves a God and we, we decide to self-govern. That was Lucifer's problem. He wanted to self-govern. He wanted to exalt his throne above that of God. And so he wanted the authority to decide how things are to be done. 
And so we live in a, a society today that has followed that same path. I remember growing up in a broken, dysfunctional family and getting out into the world, becoming a drug user, a drug dealer, living very immoral. Um, I decided for myself what was right and what was wrong. And I wasn't going to let anybody else tell me that, even if it was a law enforcement uh, agency. So it's a mindset that unless you come to surrender to this, there is a God, and that he has the right to tell his creation how to behave, how to act, how to live, and he has the power then also to restore and uh, provide the ability to walk in harmony with him. If we don't accept that, then we're going to continuously go down a path of our own choosing, and we see the results of that in society today. You know, on that note, we have, uh, we have the situation today where you have your truth and I have my truth and he has his truth, and we forget <clears throat> that truth is simply fact. And you can't have your fact and I have my fact because gravity works one way, no matter what we think. Your truth may think it works one way and mine the other, and you can test it at the edge of a cliff, but I mean, it's going to prove the fact. And without that moral authority coming from the Creator, we're like ships without a sail tossed about. There is, there, there is nothing solid to, to base it on. And that's why the world devolves into total chaos, because everyone not everyone, but people want to have their own truth instead of the truth. And Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth in the life. So I think the great controversy is coming to a precipice. I often mention to parents or even to somebody identifying as LGBT um, or actually anybody else in the universe, without Jesus Christ, you can do whatever you want. If there's, no, if, there's no, if, if there's no disciplinary action, if there is no consequence for behaviors that would not be according to the will of God, um, this, we're coming to the point where, where it's narrowing throughout our, our history, as you well demonstrated in the slides this morning. Go ahead, Kizia. Thanks. Um, one thing I did want to mention was just knowing that especially for me coming from a once being bisexual, um, it's very important to know what God has instructed us to in regards to our mission. So to your initial question, um, just seeing how Christ has sent us to be wise as serpents, yet harmless as doves. So for those of us who are well aware of God's truth, um, we have to be strategic as to how we share that truth wherever we are. Um, because of course, within our environments, wherever we are, where God has placed us, um, he has asked us to be his hands. And with that, that does call us to be prayerful as, as to how we interact with our colleagues, our classmates, um, whomever we have within our circle, and being understanding of what their truth is, like we had spoken about briefly, because um, at the end of the day, as what was presented, there are people's own personal convictions that what they feel is correct in regards to, you know, I do as I please. So we have to remember that we are not fighting, in a sense, against the flesh. We do have an enemy that we do not see, but we do have a power that is much more greater um, in regards to whatever their beliefs may be, because we know that we have a God um, that is able to surpass our own personal understanding and work on our own behalf. And to build on your um, analogy there, Ron, sometimes if you jump off a cliff, the consequences are immediate. I mean, it's very evident to everyone that this is not a good idea. But sometimes in areas of morality, it's a little more difficult. Satan has a way with, you know, leading us down a path that the consequences are not apparent until it's too late or we're very far down that road. And so sometimes in these moral discussions, you know, why not? Because look, I've been doing this and there's no apparent harm. But trusting that God knows us more than we know ourselves and knows that we can cause harm to ourselves without it being readily apparent. And that's a dangerous thing uh, to think about. Yeah, I worked for many years in Central Asia, um, mostly in Muslim nations. And I was a single guy in my 20s. And it was assumed by the Muslim men that I was gay because I wasn't sleeping with local secretaries. It was just kind of like a given. And as a result of that, I was propositioned repeatedly by Muslim men who just assumed that I was gay. Some of them were donors, some of them were consular officials, 
it was very, a very unpleasant experience. Now, Islam does not promote homosexuality, but there is a practice in many Muslim parts of the world where that kind of playing around, particularly with small boys, is considered normal. It's not considered to be homosexuality. And so there was a clear element of, of um, hypocrisy there, but likewise in the West, um, we also experience that, just like in your situation. You know, when we live in a, a Christian society and we have the abuse of children, male and female, by parents or uncles or cousins, that abuse can, can change the, the trajectory of somebody's life. And we profess one thing, often in the church, and then we go and do something at night that's very, very different and incompatible with the gospel. And so I think that you know this isn't just something that just happens in isolation. There are multiple causes for these things happening, and part of that is the abuse by the heterosexual men, generally speaking, of boys and girls, and and just changing the direction of their lives. And so we may say, where has this come from? But in my experience as a pastor, I've met multiple, multiple women to the extent that I, I came to the conclusion, man, whatever was happening in the 60s and 70s in America with small girls was horrific because I've met so many messed up people. And when you talk to them, it goes back to their childhood and they were abused by professing Christians. And so there was hypocrisy in this discussion and we need to be honest about it. And if we are involved in that kind of stuff, we need to repent like today because how many other lives are gonna be messed up um, by the hypocrisy of the heterosexual community. Um, you know, a lot of people think that, that their behaviors, that, that's their own personal choice. I'm not affecting anybody else. And, but it's not long before your behavior does encounter somebody else and impacts their lives. And then that person repeats the same thing. And, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of people with drug addiction. And a lot of it starts out in their early teens. And it starts out with just one drug, maybe perhaps marijuana or just drinking. But then they kind of graduate to the next thing and the next thing. And before you know it, they're in a, in, in a full-blown immoral, immoral relationship with somebody else. Um, and it just continues to grow. And, but the, the, the thing is, is Satan doesn't stop. You know, once he gets you going down that trail... He continues to take and engage your mind into multiple other things until he has you fully in his grip. But the good news is that Jesus came down and he provides a remedy. He provides freedom. He provides power to overcome and live a life above that of the world. And so I, I want to encourage people, you know, just think about the choices you're making. It does impact everybody else around you family and onward you know because consequences don't immediately manifest themselves i think the best approach in dealing with this issue is uh found in the words of jesus himself when he said seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you and many people come to us and want to know how how do we fix our child or fix our loved one. How do we do this? And I always say, don't address that issue first. Lead them to Christ. Because once a person develops a relationship with Christ and develops that faith and trust, then they can start believing that there are consequences. If they don't see consequences up front, maybe that's not where you need to approach them and where you need to begin. Uh, just like any other issue, in evangelism, we lead people to develop a relationship with Jesus first, <clears throat> and then the Holy Spirit will lay conviction on them that we never could. Um, we appear to be dealing, or sounding like we're dealing with the obvious here um, as it relates to LGBT+. But I, I want to make a declaration right here that we're speaking in this eight-day series um, across all sexuality. And anything that deviates from God's plan is going to bring compromise into your life. So if you're somebody who's uh, here who is struggling with uh, pornography or premarital or extramarital sex or whatever the case may be, there's, there are messages here for you because we're not we're only addressing, uh, it sounds like we're addressing LGBT issues because LGBT issues have had the spotlight for decades now, and flying under the radar is heterosexual sin. 
Well, and that's a good, very good point, Wayne. I think one of the things we need to recognize is that sin in any of its manifestations is going to, be, going to destroy us. And while I might not share the same struggle that you share, or you might have different struggles than I share, we can all relate to the fact that the solution is the same. And I think one of our challenges today in society is we are trying to find solutions apart from God. We've kind of pushed God out of the picture, and now we have... You know, everybody can decide what their own solution is going to be, and there's really, it's up to you. And we don't ever find solutions. You know, we carry that guilt forever. We carry that sin forever. We try to fix it in a human way, not realizing that God is the only solution, and he's the only one that can fix that problem, no matter what our problem is. And so that's why I appreciate hearing the testimonies and the vulnerability of people who have struggles, maybe they're different than mine, because I can relate to them in that respect, is that I have struggles too. They may be different but the solution's the same. You know, I got a, a comment on the quote by Dahmer, you know, his, his comment there. And you, you follow his thinking and you can't help but come to the same conclusion. If there's no accountability, if, if, if there is no um, realization that one day you're going to have to give an, an answer for your behavior and your, your choices in life, then what does it matter? Why not live however you want to live? I grew up not knowing that there was a God. I didn't believe there was a God. And so I was accountable to no one but myself. And so all the choices I made was based upon the fact that I'm only going to live here and then once in a while, sooner or later I'm going to die so why not live the way I want to live, get and gain at the cost of whatever it has to do with human life? It doesn't matter as long as I'm happy and I get what belongs to me in my own mindset. So when you, when you enter into that thought process of no accountability, we're, we're embarking upon a, a, a very dangerous time in Earth's history. Thank you, Dennis. One of the points I think that I saw in listening to your presentation, Dr. Vine, is that the devil is a master of extremes. Like, we seem to go back and forth between extremes. And I wonder if maybe in our last couple minutes here, maybe we'll have a little more time than this, but let's, how do we, how do we, how do we strike a balance here, a biblical balance where we're not going to extremes? We're able to, as, as Pastor Kelly challenged us earlier, to uphold, you know, to be loving, to show the grace but not leave truth behind, to have that balance in our lives. Because oftentimes, you know, we'll judge Christianity or the world judges Christianity by the, the worst or most extreme elements of Christianity. And how do, we, how do we walk that pathway, that narrow way in the middle where we can be loving and lovable Christians, uphold the truth, and draw people to Jesus? And there certainly is a ditch on either side of the road and Satan doesn't care which way you fall. And I, I have noticed that uh, in talking to people that are caught up in sexual sin, uh, heterosexual and homosexual, uh, many times there was molestation or abuse in the background. And you may have one woman who was abused by a man that becomes very sexually promiscuous heterosexually. Another one abused by a man becomes a, a man hater and becomes a lesbian. And uh, in other words, Satan doesn't care which way you fall, just so you're off track. And so it's important that we find that, that correction and that balance through Jesus Christ. Because, and, and we should not look at someone else's sin as worse than our own because they're homosexual and I'm heterosexual or vice versa. It doesn't matter. When you look at all the abominations listed in the Bible, it's spread evenly between homosexual and heterosexual. I mean, it goes all over the place. So you're right. He does master in extremes. He wants you in this ditch or that ditch, just so you're not on the path. So some of you have probably heard my pipe dream before, and that is that the organized church would make an apology to the LGBT plus community for not understanding the pain, the confusion, the chaos, the sensitivity. Um, and many of us ended up on the other side of the doors of the church. And many of us, uh, the way was paved right into the gay community, which developed a great deal of animosity against the church. 
the other side of the pipe dream is that in receiving that apology, if the LGBT community would humbly come and accept the apology, instead of lifting up self and making advocacy for self, and say, could we come together at the foot of the cross and search Jesus together? Can we study his word together? Can we study the principles of God's ways instead of our own? Because really, God is trying to get the attention of all of us. I just wanted to add um, is that it's important for us to never forget how we came to Christ. Um, because sometimes it's difficult for someone who is struggling, who is an addict, to relate to someone who seems as if they have never fallen. Um, for myself, I didn't grow up in your traditional Adventist home. And so the times when I started going to church, um, I just noticed a lot of people who were Christians, but it just seemed like Christianity or the love of God was just such a drag. So to me, it made sense why we would see like Second Timothy, uh, what is it, Second Timothy, I believe, what is it, Second Timothy 3, 5, where it talks about having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. So it makes sense, especially when it comes to young people, why young people leave the church, because when it comes to hypocrisy, when we see, let's say, your parents are active in the church, they're one way, but at home, they don't even see the power of God in the household, it makes sense why we're seeing people leave, why we, they want nothing to do with, Christ, with Christians, um, because it's as if sometimes we're not able to journey with the person who's addicted, who is struggling, um, and having a level of patience and love and compassion. Um, because for myself, um, especially when it came to being addicted to porn, um, it took me a couple of years to be free from it. It wasn't a quick, you know, overnight process where you know, I just prayed and it was over. It took me a couple of years. There were counseling and um, people that journeyed with me over the years, but who were really loving and didn't rush the process because sometimes um, what's really important is for us to remember how God journeyed with us, how graceful he was with us, how loving and understanding that there wasn't a timeline that we had to finish this in like, you know, four days. Um, there was this process that Jesus takes us on so that we're able to really commune with him and understand how loving he is with us. Amen. You know, just before I, uh, to add to that, or not to add to that, but just to echo what Pastor Kelly said earlier, if we're going to be in a position to help people, we better be the real deal. And, you know, not always living up to the values that you believe isn't different from being a hypocrite, right? The wise man stumbles, or the, the righteous man stumbles and gets up, right? We do stumble as we wrestle through life, but God gets us up. That's different than being uh, a Christian in name only, let's say. And so I think that that's a, a wonderful challenge for us that we need to go to the foot of the cross and say, Lord, let me take the plank out of my own eye. Let me fall at the foot of the cross and be broken so that I'm in a position to help those that are on that journey at whatever stage of that journey that they're on. Yeah, Jesus taught us that the second commandment is like unto the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. As I read that um, commandment of Jesus, which you find in Leviticus 19, it's, it's, the, it's the call to uh, moral restraint. Because if I do what I want to do and only what I want to do, regardless of the impact on society, then there may be a positive impact for society, there may be a negative impact. There's a story of a lady who had a terminal cancer diagnosis, and so she opened a number of credit cards and booked around the world cruise on those credit cards, knowing she wasn't going to come back and pay them. Now, in fulfilling her own desires, there was a social consequence to, that, you know, to the, the, the financial sector. And it's kind of a trite example, but it illustrates the fact that if I live just for what I want to do, period, without loving my neighbor as myself, without considering what are the long-term social consequences of what I am doing, um, then there's going to be you know, a, a gradual degradation of society. Um, you know, parents struggling, are they going to stay together or get divorced? Well, I can tell you the impact of divorce is multi-generational on those children. And so the decisions we make today, am I going to seek my own happiness today, which is transient? And the more I seek my own happiness, the less happy I find myself. Or am I going to live to love my neighbor as myself and seeking, saying, well, what are the social consequences of my decisions? And uh, asking myself, is this going to bless society or not? And it seems to me that what we're seeing in America tonight, today, as we see this kind of chaos and breakdown at, at multiple dimensions, 
is the, is the net consequence of, lo- of hundreds of millions of people making self-centered decisions rather than seeking to love their neighbors as themselves. And we're all part of that process. Amen. We have about just less than two minutes left. I thought maybe we could go around and maybe a word of encouragement, someone is struggling with whatever addiction or whatever sin that we might be wrestling with, just a word of encouragement perhaps from your background, from your experience that could uplift them and give them courage. You know, I'd say uh, come to the Bible and let God be God. And uh, understanding that you may gain a, a physical freedom from addiction or a lifestyle, but God wants to then free us mentally and emotionally as well. He wants to restore the whole being. And Christ offers that from forgiveness to grace that empowers the individual to walk faithfully with him according to the word. And let us let him guide and direct us. Let him be God. Yeah, I, I would just echo that in, in recognizing that, that God holds the solutions and the answers and that God is trustworthy. Beg- begin your journey to the foot of the cross. Um, I know it's really important that when we come to a realization that we are going to decide, especially when you know you're struggling, um, is that you are going to commit to that journey of healing. So when I say commit, that means that no matter how the journey looks, because the journey is not going to be clean, um, is that you have already made that decision that I will commit to this journey of trusting Jesus. As it says in Proverbs 3, 5, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto thine own understanding, um, especially with someone who has been struggling with a sex addiction or whatever particular addiction it may be from, especially from childhood, um, to understand that that journey may be a lengthy process. But if you've already made the decision in your mind that you are going to commit, that you will commit to Jesus in trusting him no matter how the journey will look. I would just say John 3.17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him um, it might be saved. And that's a beautiful message of hope. And we as Christians have the same attitude as well. You know, for many years of my life, I was labeled even by Seventh-day Adventist pastors as someone who is unchangeable. And so as a consequence, I was bitter and angry and resentful against God and the church and pastors. <laughs> and I became unreachable. But I just, uh, I just encourage one, everyone to realize that God does specialize in reaching the unreachable and changing the unchangeable. And I think a word of the necessity of prayer in those situations, in all situations, that God is more interested in our salvation than we are, and he's doing everything he can. Before we close with prayer, I want to remind everyone here and those watching online that uh, our second service will start in a moment, and it will be different from the first. Pastor Kelly is going to be sharing a different message for the second service, so I'd encourage you to stay by, and then also a reminder this evening to join us at 6 o'clock for our evening program. And uh, I'm wondering, Wayne, if you would offer a closing prayer for us as we close our panel. Let's bow our heads together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity that we still have to talk about Um, the beauty of Christ, uh, the saving ability of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask that you would impart the Holy Spirit to help us see our great need of Christ. And I thank you for everyone who is gathered here, everyone who is gathered online, and for whomever may watch this in post-production, Lord. Uh, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will come and help people recognize that God's ways are perfect. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So as we move into the second service, as we... as we move into the second service, as it's been our tradition, we move up one pew and uh, we'll continue to sit in those pews for the second service then. Thank you. So that'll be the pews without the blue tape. <laughs>